Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Ramsey Center Lecture Series for 2023. Um, I'm Simon Haynes. Uh, welcome also on behalf of our chairman, John Howard, who's here this evening, and other members of our board, Michael Eason, uh, and another one that I'll mention in just a second. Um, wonderful to be back in this beautiful room, which feels like our home away from home with Matthew Flinders and his cat just outside the window, Shakespeare over that way, and the Ramsey Centre over that way. Um, a special welcome, can I just say, to any of our wonderful Ramsey scholars. Are there any hands up? Yay. Great to, great to see you. Um, you are, as I'm always saying, you are the most important people in the room, so keep coming and bring your friends. It's also good to see a number of new faces here this evening. I'm imagining possibly from the, the teaching community. Um, and again, please come back. Um, don't make this the only time you visit us. We have a terrific program um, coming up, which I'll tell you about in just a second. But first of all, I want to begin, uh, as usual, by acknowledging the person, the one person without whom absolutely nothing that we do, the, the scholarships at undergraduate level, postgraduate level, the university support that we're able to offer in the humanities, or indeed any of these events, none of this would be possible without our amazing benefactor, the late, great Paul Ramsey. Uh, his is a truly unique legacy, which we do our very best to honor. And maybe that's especially true on an occasion like tonight when we're talking about the education of young people. I remember when I, had first, when I first joined the Ramsey Center, I was taken to see Paul Ramsey's last office that he occupied in the Ramsey Health Building in, uh, in St. Leonard's, an extremely modest uh, little space um, in keeping with his, with his character. But the one interesting, the most interesting thing about it was that the window view, as you looked out of the window in, uh, in, in St. Leonard's, what you could see was his old school. And Paul's school was extremely important to him, uh, and that seems appropriate when we're talking about the education of young people this evening. Um, one more thing that I usually do before we start, just a quick reminder, a promotion uh, about a few of the other treats that we have in store for any of you who, who will come later this year. Coming up next month on the 21st, we'll be hearing from the Melbourne scholar and public intellectual John Carroll, uh, a prolific writer on Western civilization, and this time he's going to be talking on the theme of um, who will save us now? His latest book is called The Saviour Syndrome, and he'll be thinking about Western civilization as being characterized by a need for saviour figures to give meaning to life. And that chimes in quite well with an online talk that we've got planned later in the year by Professor Remy Brague, who is at the University of Paris. Uh, he is one of today's most eminent historians of philosophy and thinkers about the nature of the West. And he'll be talking about, uh, in, in English, not, not in French, he'll be talking about his famous book, Eccentric Cultures, A Theory of Western Civilization. That'll be in October. And then a month before that, in September, live in, I think it's in this room, possibly it's in the Mint, just up, just up the road, we'll be hosting Professor Robert Toombs from Cambridge talking about his History Reclaimed project, uh, which, to use his own words, is designed to push back against false readings of history which create or aggravate divisions, resentments, and even violence in society. So that's just some of the things to look forward to. Also, it's become kind of traditional for me to announce that one of these days we will be hosting live the distinguished historian and broadcaster Bethany Hughes, um, in Sydney. She's done a couple of wonderful talks for us online, and many of you will have seen her online, uh, her SBS series on Sunday evenings, so it will be a treat eventually to see her here in person. She keeps having to defer because the archaeological digs that she's trying to organize in the Middle East keep getting put off by whoever the local um, ruler or potentate is, so we're hoping early in the new year to see Bethany. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, I'm recording a conversation uh, at the Ramsey Center 
with Emily Langston, who is the Director of Graduate Programs at St. John's College in Annapolis in the US, about why the liberal arts programs and great books programs are so important and what is so special about them. So you'll be able to see that online in a couple of weeks. A last announcement before we start. Please remember after the event today, there will be snacks and drinks at the back of the room. Do please stay, uh, talk to each other, meet our guests, meet our board members after the event. So now it's a very great honor and pleasure for the Ramsey Center to welcome tonight's panelists to this special colloquium on secondary education. Now, of course, the center's usual focus is on universities, but we and our university partners do in fact run summer schools for year 11 and 12 high school students every year. And of course, we also every year select three sets of undergraduate scholars, uh, one at each of our partners, so in any given year, we at the center will meet at least a couple of hundred high school students. And we form some pretty strong impressions of how they've been taught and what they've been taught, much of it very much to the credit of their schools and their teachers. But that contact prompted us to send a submission to last year's curriculum assessment and reporting agency, ACARA, uh, review of the federal school curriculum where we expressed some concerns about a almost overwhelming focus on three cross-curricular themes that seem to be crowding out too many other important themes to do with uh, our Western cultures and institutions. They, they were being a bit squeezed, we thought. But we also read a lot of the submissions from the teachers and that gave us a very clear impression that there was something quite difficult going on in schools in terms of levels of frustration, um, levels of feeling swamped, um, as well as of feeling very committed uh, on the part of teachers to what they were doing. Anyway, all of that experience got us thinking that irrespective of what your views may be on any of these issues, it might be good to put on school-related events more often, since the centre does have a broad remit to advance education in general by promoting studies and discussion associated with the development of Western civilization. And obviously it's in the schools, primary as well as secondary, where the foundation is laid for what young people and future citizens think of themselves and their society and the wider world that they will inherit. So with that background, we've been extremely lucky in persuading three most distinguished speakers to join us on the panel this evening to talk about secondary education laying the foundation. And the format that we'll be using is that each speaker will talk for about five to seven minutes about an issue in secondary education that seems of special importance to her. And then each of us on the panel will ask a question uh, and then at the end, and then it'll be the turn of the next speaker, and after we've heard from all three, there should be plenty of time for further questions from anybody from the floor. So, let me now just briefly introduce our three distinguished guests from this end to that end. So, starting with the first speaker, because this is the order that you'll, you'll speak in, if that's okay. Uh, the first speaker is Eleanor Douglas the founder and CEO, and by the way, I'll introduce all of them now and then save your applause for the end. Um, founder and CEO of Knowledge Society, uh, a social purpose business that designs and delivers school improvement and research to impact programs for Australian schools, universities, and research institutes. Eleanor has led the establishment of Advanced Global Australians in New York, as well as the Centre for Social Impact at the University of Western Australia, uh, the In the Zone conference series, and also she's led the Faith and Globalization Initiative, which is a partnership with the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. Uh, Eleanor's perspective is shaped by her career as an economist, an entrepreneur, and an historian. She teaches philanthropy, so we're gonna to have to mind our P's and Q's at the Ramsey Center. She teaches philanthropy at the UWA Business School and she researches 18th and 19th century conceptions of virtue, economics, and ethics. 
And then our second speaker is Dr. Sarah Goldsby-Smith, uh, Head of Learning and Teaching at PLC Sydney, uh, one of Australia's oldest and most respected girls' schools. Sarah is the practicing teacher on the panel this evening. She's taught English in secondary schools for over 20 years. She's taught in government and independent schools, in co-ed, boys and girls schools, and has enjoyed all of those spaces to teach and learn. She's published work on literary theory and its relationship to pedagogy, on the new rhetoric, on Shakespeare in the classroom, particularly close to my own heart, Sarah, um, on the poetry of Gwen Harwood, ditto, um, and on theological considerations for the teacher. And her abiding interest, her vocation, I suppose I could say, is in the importance of the classroom as both a civic and a holy space, as she puts it, where truth is both made and discovered. Beautiful. And our third speaker, Elizabeth Stone, is principal of Queenwood School, another long-established, very distinguished girls' school in Sydney. Elizabeth sits on several boards, including the Association of Independent Schools, New South Wales, and the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization. In fact, um, Elizabeth, I think you are the first board member ever to appear on the podium at one of our Ramsey Centre lecture. Yet another first for you. Um, she took up a Rhodes Scholarship and then completed her Masters at University College, Oxford, where I also taught many years before you were there, I should say. Um, uh, she later moved into teaching and taught mathematics, first in Sydney and then in the UK, uh, returning to Australia in 2014 to take up her present role at Queenwood. Uh, and then, remarkably, she will be returning to the UK in September 2023 as, and I'm using this word advisedly, headmaster of Winchester College, because you're called headmaster there, right? Um, the first woman and first Australian to hold this position in 640 years, uh, in one of the oldest and most distinguished academic institutions in the world. Extraordinary. So, um, uh, enough introduction. Please welcome our three panellists. So today I wanted to talk about memory, memoria, and its importance for human survival and flourishing. Memory is absolutely vital for individuals and for society. It's the job we give to education to build memory, even if this thought has been forgotten at the present time. Today I want to talk a little bit about both the art and the science of memory. The reason memory is so important is that memory is the store we use to make meaning of our experiences and to take action in the world. The wider my experience palette that I possess from my reading, that I particularly gain from my education, the wider my perspective and ultimately the greater my range of options and the better my judgment. With no panorama, we become engulfed in our own experience and that of our peer group. All of us are the descendants of people who triumphed over adversity. But as a culture, we have become so disinterested in the cultivation of memory and knowledge about the past that very few people even know their own family history, let alone the nation's history or the history of the civilizations that have informed our nation. Enriched memory from all sources creates a more robust people. Indigenous people in this country who have had to triumph over unbelievable adversity uh, demonstrate how important stories are to humans. Humans are story dwellers. We have no home without memory and stories. And very importantly, as citizens, we need a common set of stories to belong to. To not know what happened before you were born is to remain 
forever a child, said Cicero. So by this measure, we are now a society that has almost lost the art of forming adults. Our education system now graduates a majority of young people who do not possess a coherent view of the past. They have not been given the panorama of how we got to here. And just as we saw with our individuals, societies that don't have strong memory cannot interpret the events around them as they happen in the most enriching, and, uh, in the most enriching way. When they lack historical perspective, they lack insight and options. They lack the ability to make comparisons with a wide range of relevant other examples and therefore they lack intelligence. As statesmen and women have told us for centuries and even millennia, memory is everything. Memory provides the building blocks of belonging. Stratford Caldecott tells us, the collective memory of the society to which we belong has the name tradition. We cannot be truly at home without one. In every society or civilization, we ought to hand over the knowledge, the stories, the accumulated wisdom from one generation to the next. The task of education was once to share the memory banks with, uh, with the next generation so that they did not have to discover or work everything out for themselves within a generation from first principles. They could stand on the shoulders of giants, see further and improve on their society. But as I'm sure we'll get into tonight, something changed in both our approach to curriculum and our approach to pedagogy. Curriculum, what we teach, pedagogy, how we teach. We stopped believing that our purpose as educators was to hand on inheritance, the inheritance. And that's, I'm, there are loads of wonderful teachers who are very much inspired by that that um, mission, but they have sadly, I believe, become the minority. Our education system at some point embraced the ideas of constructivism and skills-based education. Teachers started giving up on knowledge. Memorization started to be demonized as rote learning. Teacher-led instruction started to be demonised as the sage on the stage, whereas the idea now is that you're meant to be the guide on the side and that the child should lead their instruction through their own motivations and interests. There's also a view, a very, very wide and pervasive view, that children don't need to know things. They don't need to know facts, events, concepts or panoramas, schemas of understanding or disciplinary knowledge. They, we're told they can just Google it. But memorisation and teacher-led instruction remain the most effective and powerful tools we have as educators. <coughs> Let's take a maths example. Many Australian primary schools, we fear it is now most, are no longer teaching times tables to mastery, as was the practice in prior generations. Now, you cannot do algebra or geometry successfully, let alone higher order maths like calculus, unless you know your times tables with absolute automaticity and you know them off by heart. Knowledge builds on knowledge. High school desperately relies on primary school and so on. There is no way to solve the problem of shortages of engineers and maths trained students at higher levels of education unless you have a population that has learned their times tables by heart. Let's turn to the science now of learning. So um, times tables is just one tiny example. So the science of learning. Now there is a growing body of science which goes by the name either of the architecture of human cognition or the science of learning. 
I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of the science of learning in 10 propositions. And by the way, this is regarded as the most important, uh, the most important uh, research for teachers to know about. So the human brain is structured with a very limited working memory and with an enormous, we believe, infinite long-term memory. So in the science of learning, learning is defined by a change in long-term memory. So long-term memory is that which I can access with automaticity, like the times tables I was mentioning before. So our task as educators, I believe, is to get the maximum amount of stories and concepts and disciplinary schemas into long-term memory. To get knowledge into long-term memory, it needs to be broken up into small chunks that don't overwhelm working memory. Otherwise, we don't get the knowledge there. Attention, the science tells us, is scarce, and we have to be aware of minimising distraction so as to maximise the cognitive load that we leave for the acquisition of the new knowledge. We need to build knowledge sequentially. We start with vocab and concepts and then add in a systematic and cumulative way. The beauty of, of how humans learn is that knowledge sticks to knowledge. And once you have the schema of knowledge built, facts, disciplinary notions, concepts, people, events, you can add more knowledge much more easily. That's the process of going from novice to expert. But we need repetitions and retrieval so that we encode that knowledge. And once it's there, it can be accessed at will and the beauty of how human, the human mind works is that once something's in long-term memory, it no longer uses working memory for me to use that knowledge uh, with the limits of my working memory. I can bring five things at once, bang, and then be uh, working easily if it's in my long-term memory. So it enables, it enables us to synthesise and put things together. But when we're novices and we're learning something new and we haven't built the schema, we can get cognitive overload very easily. So I hope I haven't gone too fast in providing that picture of how humans acquire new knowledge and uh, the science of, or the architecture of human cognition and why it is that we can't um, do, we, we don't benefit uh, in classrooms by applying with young children and early novice learners inquiry learning because it overwhelms the child with um, too, many, too many things at once when what would be more, uh, more effective is stories and um, adding, building on the knowledge that we've already given them. So to go with the example of the times tables, that if I have my times tables in long-term memory, then I can come to do algebra and calculus or complicated problems, and I can access all of the knowledge from my long-term memory and then work with the new bits I'm getting, like the, the pieces of the problem, and I can add those in. So I, I commend you all to you know, find out more, those of you who are in education, if you don't know about the science of learning, uh, find out more about it. It's very, very powerful. But there are very big implications of this for memory and for the role of schools. So our schools are now, uh, this brings me to the topic of how, as a society, we're solving the problem of providing memory to our students. So in the 1980s and 90s, the average primary school teacher would not write their own lessons. They would be given by our government education departments instructional materials, textbooks, assessments, programs of work. And their task as a teacher in primary school, but also in high school, would be to deliver that curriculum. Or in schools, the schools would have a whole of school approach to curriculum. This changed and now we have a situation which, as the Grattan Institute report uh, recently done, shows that our primary school and high school teachers are creating curriculum themselves, uh, sorry, instructional materials, lessons themselves from scratch. There are almost no textbooks being used in Australian schools now. 
It's very rare to find textbooks. So what we've done is we've gone from a world where we carefully curated uh, instructional materials that were shared at the state level to all schools, and we've eliminated that. And now we just have very thin standards, just statements of standards. And then it's left to not just the school, but the individual teacher, more often than not, to create their own teaching program. So that means we have primary school teachers who are doing up to 700 of their own lessons a year that they are writing. And they are not, uh, they've often not done any other education other than uh, initial teacher education, which focuses on process, not on knowledge. Mm. So we have, that, that's how we approach curriculum uh, resources and creation of the materials on how to teach in the majority of schools. So, so that, if I just give a quick example, UK history versus Australian history, year nine. The UK history, um, the UK history curriculum, so now I'll come to standards and specificity of knowledge to be learned. In the UK history curriculum, it'll say, William the Conqueror must know these 20 facts, these concepts, these ideas, and it'll be very specific on the knowledge that needs to be learnt by the student. The Australian curriculum will say in Year 9 something like, um, uh, must have uh, no local history and have a sense of place. So this vague concept that I, as a, as a, as a teacher, and meant to work out the how of creating in my student's mind a sense of place. So we just, we don't, we, um, th th that's the sort of the difference. Mm. So the, it, when we change how we approach the creation of the shared materials and knowledge for our education system, we actually change how much knowledge we uh, have as a society that we share. And that has a massive influence on how we, the shared language we have, the shared stories we have, and our ability to come together and not be fragmented and to make decisions on a shared understanding and picture uh, of the world. So it has enormous um, ramifications. So, I, so this is all a way of saying that we currently have... Um, a fragmented, incoherent approach to curriculum and curriculum resourcing, and it is creating a nation with a very weak memory. We are story dwellers. We need stories and knowledge and perspectives that we all share, that we belong to. And um, there's a lot of people now arguing internationally, Nat Natalie Wexler, Edie Hirsch, Daisy Kristen Dulu. And in Australia, Jenny Donovan from the Australian Education Research Organisation, Ben Jensen from Learning First, Jordana Hunter from Grattan, OCA Education, Teach Well, and my colleagues at both Primary Focus and Knowledge Society and the Centre for Independent Studies. And we're all arguing that Australia needs to return to very rich instructional materials provided to our teachers from primary uh, and high school, and uh, a knowledge-rich um, approach um, with quality uh, materials and support and scaffolding for our teachers, and that will improve um, our memory banks. So, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sarah. Now, it's, it's over to your fellow panellists if they have any questions that they'd oh. like to <laughs> ask you. Well, I was just teaching, trying to teach a weak set of year eight how to do fractions and they couldn't do their times tables. So, yes, um, <laughs> big vote yes from me. Um, in America, for instance, the person who um, came up with the idea of these are the things that are most useful to know. If you had to open the newspaper and you want to understand what's going on in the world for an American child, Edie Hirsch did this yes. sort of seminal work in the 80s. Uh, who's going to do it for Australia? There, there's a, a posse developing. Some of the people I mentioned amongst this group, I think we do, we do want to, I think at the moment, particularly Ben Jensen and, 
and I um, are very keen to create the coalition of the willing to fund and do a core knowledge approach for Australia. Mm. So, you know, at the moment, we don't think... Um, people like Jordana Hunter from Grattan Institute who know this has to be done has given me advice that she thinks it would be very difficult now for a state government to, to do what it did in the 80s mm. and 90s, that mm. actually the political issues around curriculum would be so intense that a state government wouldn't be able to technic not technically pull it off, politically pull it off, yeah. so that it's likely to need to be um, a, uh, a pretty rounded and, and cross-section group of educators, mm -hmm. so it won't be able, you know, need to be quite uh, reflective of Australian uh, community, but done, uh, done separate to government and given back as a philanthropic gesture to the nation. Mm -hmm. That's. Yeah. Could I just add? I know you've got a bit. Um, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, in the ERRR podcast by Ollie Lovell um, and Ben, ben, yeah. <laughs> ben did a fantastic yes. uh, sort of two, three hour conversation. But anybody who's interested in um, how the awful sausage is made of the Australian curriculum, mm. <laughs> that he, he sets it out beautifully. And I think it would be shocking to almost anybody who's not quite expert in this to understand how much it is a political process rather than an educational one. It's quite, quite mm. shocking. Mm. Um, mm. So. Mm. Sarah, did you want to...? I think the question I have is, um, you, you spoke about um, n knowledge existing um, outside the child. Um, and the question I have probably comes from John Dewey's Child in the Curriculum, which yes. I was quite fascinated by as a younger teacher. Um, I can't remember how I stumbled on it. Um, it's not long. Um, but, but the idea there is that um, a true knowledge can be formed not by viewing those two things as a dichotomy, but a continuum, as a kind of a conversation where there's a tension in between them. So there's the things we want the child to learn, and then there are the child's questions, which yes. generate a conversation. Mm. I'm just wondering if you could... Are, are they a dichotomy, or can we view them in conversation and useful tension? So I've got two answers to that. One is that because I'm a, a science of learning person, we make the distinction between biologically primary knowledge and biologically secondary knowledge. So there's so many things. So, for instance, family folk history. I think that is every child's birthright to know three or four generations back of their own family. It just, it just no child should not get that. That can't be done at school. It's not to be done at school. It's a family thing. So there's so much knowledge that one should attain from outside of school. But what we need to focus on at school is biologically secondary knowledge. So biologically primary knowledge, by the way, is speaking and listening and story and singing and you know these things that all humans have done long before the invention of schools or even you know Plato and Aristotle's lyceums, like just things that are natural to humans. So any learning that can fit into that is the Dewey learning and is really rich and important. Whereas the, the purpose of the classroom to me is a little bit of that, but mainly it's the biologically secondary knowledge. It's that which I can only attain if someone helps me control my attention and focus me on this particular thing. And that then we as teachers have to teach in ways that holds that attention. So that, that's my answer. Mm -hmm. That then you're, it's sort of, you're teaching the things that, like times tables, it's, it isn't as, I don't think it's as fun as family history, but I have to learn it if I'm going to, for instance, you know, I do a lot of work in equity, and if we want to close the equity gap, we have to teach kids maths at the very highest level in the very poorest schools. Mm -hmm. And I have to be able to teach those kids times tables or if I just wait to the things that they, they want to construct and they're interested in, I, I can't get them the good jobs. And <laughs> can I throw in a comment there? Just to, you know, we, we teach every year eight kid Pythagoras theorem, you know, A squared plus B squared, squared equals C squared. Every year eight kid can grasp it. But Pythagoras was a genius. You know, that was the pinnacle of a lifetime achievement and hundreds of years to lead up to it. Um, if we 
sort of try and put them in some kind of number sand pit mm. and wait for them to come up themselves. Of course. Yeah. Realistically, they're not going to do it, right? Uh, and year eight's well and truly over. So we, we've, there's just times you've got to teach them, right? Yeah. Of course, of course. And I'm not mm. suggesting but that, that there's not question. times to teach mm. it. No, yeah. I guess I'm um, probably I'm framed by the fact that I'm an English teacher. And so I'm wondering, I suppose my follow-up question is, are there epistemological considerations as to what type of... Su it, it, does it depend on what subject you're teaching? Ah. For instance, in my subject, which is English literature... Yeah. Um, so maybe just thinking about the time, maybe if you'd like to do your, yes. your, your piece, yes. Sarah, then we can go back to this at the end of that. Yeah. 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 I'm okay. just wondering I'll if there's epistemological... I'll come back, I'll come back to does that. Does it shift? Yeah. 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 Over to you. OK. Um, I was talking to my dear friend, Will Christie, who um, suggested that I begin by saying that what I'm about to say probably comes from what I have been telling my staff is a teacherly imagination. <laughs> um, that although I have done research and published research, that my interests have come from the classroom. The questions I have are from the classroom mm. and couldn't have been imagined in any other way. So I'm going to tell some stories today. Um, and so I guess I'm saying that it is both what I am saying, but the way I've come to it, hmm. that probably captures uh, what I'm interested in. Um, so this, this story began at the beginning of the year. And I guess I was harried, and I had had parents, and I had come from the classroom, and my phone rang, and I picked it up. Um, normally, I'm very polite on the phone, if you should ever call. Um, but, but this person called and said, would I like to come to a conference on evidence-based practice? <laughs> and for whatever reason, um, I didn't sugarcoat it in any vanilla prose, but said, I actually think all teachers are responding to data and evidence all the time, written on the face of their students. I think the word data is not big enough or fast enough or sophisticated enough for what teachers do and need to do. There was a pause on the other end of the phone and he said, oh, I might uh, give you a call later at another type of conference. <laughs> um, and, and then I, I thought to myself, what, what, what is that about? What framed my response? Um, and while I think there's something in this memory of mine to prompt perhaps better manners when I'm feeling harried, I've thought a lot about this moment in, in terms of what I failed to articulate nicely or no. Um, but I did have something to articulate, and that is, I suppose, the place of empiricism in education, mm. um, in terms of the scientific understanding, which I think is a little bit separate, adjacent, yeah. um, to what it is that happens in classrooms all over the world at any given time. No teacher in classrooms at the moment will be a stranger to this idea of data or evidence-based practice as the marker of a modern teacher. It's written into our accreditation standards. Every teacher needs to show some sort of familiarity with the way data works. Um, we can see this sort of thing in the formative and summative tasks we set. We can um, see it in Dylan Williams' idea of formative assessment, whereby a teacher runs a series of assessments and then makes a set of decisions based on, the, on that data and so on and so forth. In John Hattie's metadata, which lots of high school teachers have become interested in, um, where producing and aggregating megadata produced by many classrooms across schools can help us make decisions putatively on teaching and learning in systems. Um, we can see it in the, in the centrality of standardized testing, um, at all levels of schooling and the concomitant anal analysis of that data. Um, and we can see it in the metric that universities use to admit students into university in Australia. Um, and as I said, we can also see it in the way teachers are accredited. Um, I wish to say, first of all, that I, I do believe in data. I think data is important. Um, Analyzing how students perform on informal and formal testing occasions, it's vital information for any educator interested in a young person's growth or in the growth of our young people today. Absolutely, teachers need to be able to respond to data by considering different pedagogical options available to them so as to provide ways for their students to grow and learn, of course. But the question I want to ask today is, is it a good enough tool to situate the entire work of what a classroom teacher does. 
is there a system of thinking behind the call for data and evidence-based practice that is big enough to capture what it is we do? I think you can probably guess that my answer is no. Um, when I was a much younger woman um, and hadn't actually enrolled in a Bachelor of Education yet and was toying with other sorts of things to do, I encountered a similar idea in another setting. Um, it was an introductory class on psychology, my first year of university, and the lecturer had put up a slide called Human Perception. On the following slides, he had diagrams of the human eye with all the associated terms for each part. And the idea was that if we could analyze the way a human eye worked, then we could ex extrapolate from that to work out psychologically how human beings put perception together. Mm. I was sitting on the left-hand side of the lecture theater because it was the closest to the exit at the time. <laughs> Um, and I remember turning to my right and seeing the light of the overhead projector on the, lights of my fellow, on the faces of my fellow students. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me, are we asking the wrong question? Look at all those perceivers looking at the act of perception. Look at all the eyes looking at the eye. How can we talk about what it is to perceive without first acknowledging that we are perceivers in the simultaneous second that we ask and frame that question? I stayed in some psychology long enough to know what the response to those questions might be. If we winnow out the taintedness of human perception by running randomized tests, by running anonymized trials, by aggregating data, by calling on statistics, which seem to have the pattern of that arm's length evidence, and striving at all times for objectivity, then we can decrease the chances that our findings are sullied by our own perceptions as human beings. The trouble with this, of course, is that it doesn't ever fully take the human question out of the affair. Under the lab coat is a human body in time and space, what the philosopher Heidegger called thrownness. Nor does it prove the validity of the assumption that having the human question in the mix sullies anything. In other words, this line of inquiry was based upon the idea that scientific ways of knowing were sufficient and appropriate to the question being posed. But what if it isn't? Hmm. At this point, I want to bring the object of our interest into focus, where I have spent most of my day today. A classroom full of students. Brand new human beings. Not quite formed, confident one day, anxious the next. Um, some of these human beings who tell stories to each other, some of their families tell stories to them, some of them don't. Some of these stories are true and some not. Um, some of them come from different ethnic backgrounds, some from different socioeconomic experiences, some have had breakfast that morning, some have not. And this is all before we talk about the teacher in the room who brings with, with her all of these variables plus the richness of years of experience in the classroom. Um, and even by scientific standards, I think it's clear that defining what the control and the variable is in that moment is always going to be a treacherous affair. Um, I think back to that diagram with the eye on it um, and the arrows of one part leading to another. If we're going to examine a classroom and its effectiveness, it seems to me there are too, uh, too many arrows to keep track of the relationship one to the other. So what if defining controls and variables is the least of our troubles? What if we are asking the wrong question as we seek to know what a classroom is, how to make it better, how to be better as a profession? The, Gilbert, the, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle talks about an epistemological category error. What he means by this is that we can't walk into an English classroom and say, where are your controls and variables? Because an English classroom doesn't necessarily operate like that. Um, we can't, for example, um, walk into a, a poetry or philosophy classroom and ask, how can I fix my car when it won't start? The two don't fit. All those questions are important in their own right, but applied to the wrong context, they're useless, if not comical. So this begs the question, what type of thing are we talking about when we talk about a classroom? What type of thing is teaching? What type of thing is learning? What is a classroom? What is the right evaluative tool to pick up when I want to talk about how successful a classroom is or not? 
to work out how well a teacher executes her work or how well a student is learning. I'm going to tell a couple of stories, so bear with me. Um, in my second year of teaching, I had a student called Nick. I think of him often. I wish I could say thank you to him. <laughs> he was in year nine, and he was infamous at the government school that I taught at. He would sit next to the wall, um, leaning up against it, and he would scribble on his book and on the light switch next to him with his liquid paper, and then look up at me as if to say, what are you going to do about that? Hmm? What? He would lean back in his chair as if to affect an insouciance, I think, that he wanted to project. He expected, he expected that disciplinary talk to come back at him. Um, and I almost heard him think, I know how this game goes. If I lean back and scowl, a teacher will tell me to get to work, and that, I'm guess him, guessing, made him feel both rejected and secure at the same time, because he knew what to expect. Um, there were those around Nick who would watch him and take cues, other boys, um, whose books were slightly neater than his, but they were looking to Nick and looking to me to see what I would do about that. It's interesting to consider the human beings in this situation in all their complexity. There's Nick, who had made the decision to distance himself from learning for whatever reason, and a history of teachers telling him um, that confirmed to him the foolishness of this decision. This I know to be true because I'd heard them in the staff room. There were other boys who perceived this standoff and were either looking for comic relief or an outlet for their own sense of estrangement or adolescent um, disorientation. And then there were the slew of girls who watched all this and watched me to see how I would respond. So you can see what um, the, the complexity of this affair. And then there was me. Um, I'm going to tell a story about my own background. I'm the eldest of four. After me come two brothers and then a sister. Um, they are all very intelligent men and women. Um, my, both of my brothers, I now understand, would probably nowadays be diagnosed with ADHD. I have one brother who is also dyslexic at the same time, and both of those brothers, um, I, I watched as they came home from school every day with a look of resignation and exhaustion. One of them got kicked out before he even arrived. <laughs> And then I watched the younger one after he finished school. It was quite a miracle. Um, decide as soon as he had graduated, done his HSC, he picked up Anna Karenina and read it. And then he picked up Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment and read that. This stuck with me. Why was it that my intelligent brothers, and particularly that one, couldn't access the education he was getting at his school? So I had that in, this, in the back of my mind when Nick presented himself to me. Um, before I finish this story, I want to stand back for a minute. When standardised cohort or class testing is applied to my own discipline, English or language arts, we narrow the aperture to argument or concept and the mechanics of writing. And there's a lot to be said for this. I believe in it. Um, but that schema, I somehow knew when I looked at that first year nine classroom I had would not tell me what Nick could do. It would not help me with Nick, who was statistically, says the data, at the bottom of his cohort. How many controls and variables are there truly in the sketch I have drawn of that year nine classroom I had? If I were to draw a picture of that situation, as my psychology lecturer had done with the human eye, um, there are too many arrows of connection to demonstrate any meaningful map of cause and correlation, let alone cause and effect. The students in that class were perceiving their content matter, sure, but they are also perceiving me, perceiving them, as those massive attack lyrics <laughs> that came to me when I was writing this in a song from Safe From Harm in tone. I was looking back at you to see if you were looking back, me to, back at me to see me looking back at you. When we're in a classroom, the student's perception frames the knowledge they take in, just as my perception of them frames the kind of decisions I make as their teacher. All of this suggests to me that the scientific mode of teaching, which assumes that numerical data is sufficient to work out what a student knows or not, is not wholly fit for purpose. A classroom is not a laboratory. Why? I think perhaps our answer might begin in ancient Greece. <laughs> Um, Aristotle gave us three categories of knowledge. Episteme, or scientific knowledge. 
techne, or skills and crafts, and phrenesis, or practical knowledge, which is applied to where things, where things can be other than they are, or the thing studied is moving and fluid or decided upon by a human beings who get together. It seems to me that education is this third category, phrenesis, where we decide, either by devilish committee or otherwise, we decide what it is we are going to do in that classroom. It occurs to me that in our, in our modern world, we've used, we have assumed that episteme is sufficient to cover all kinds of knowledge, explaining why we try and apply the pattern of scientific study to markets or human behavior or classrooms. Um, and there are not a few commentators who would say that the first of these was Rene Descartes, who committed the first of our inherited epistemological category errors by assuming that episteme could account for all human knowing. But as we can see in my second year of teaching, the thing I was apprehending was in no way fixed and cannot be other than it is, which is scientific knowledge. In that case, applying the set of tools that come with scientific knowledge, a model that comes with controls and variables and extracts, the, and extracts the human perceiving out of the equation to keep data pure is wholly misplaced. There are so many moving parts in the scenario that I had in front of me, and that is that is all not to mention that the scenario was watching me too. Mm. The category from which I think classrooms come is then phrenesis. It's a world wherein possibilities are endless and the outcome of classrooms is not neat enough to behave in a linear-like fashion. What did I do with Nick? Well, to tell that story, I'd have to tell the story of another boy and I will try to tell it quickly. The year before, I had inherited, so Nick was my second year. In my first year, I had um, a group of 30 children in year nine, um, and they were difficult. Um, I also, I was 23. I remember a boy called Stephen. I remember him so well. I couldn't find a way to connect with him. That's why I remember him. Um, I remember the resentment written all over his face and being unable to find a way to communicate with him. I also remember him because one day I had the whiteboard marker and I was using it as a conch. And I was passing it around trying to get a conversation going. And when I threw the conch or the, or the whiteboard marker to Stephen, he threw it back at me mm. hard. What he was saying was, I'm angry. It wasn't throwing, it wasn't passing a conversation. And I knew in that moment that I had failed him. If I could see him today, I would apologize. <laughs> that class stood still and they held their breath watching what I'd do. I can't actually remember what I did. It kind of been too bad because I didn't have to go and talk to the deputy principal about anything. <laughs> but my point is, is that in teaching Stephen and in thinking about what I had done and what I had done poorly and what I had not understood changed what I did with Nick the following year. What I did with Nick was I left him alone for six weeks. And when, I, when he and his friend were talking and disrupting, I asked the friend next to him, sorry friend, to be quiet. Then I put my fingers on his desk. And then I just stood with my body close to him so as he would know I'm close to you, I know what's going on, but I'm not gonna call you out in front of everybody else. He wasn't ready to learn yet. Then slowly, he worked out that I wasn't ever going to call him out or humiliate him. Finally, I would move around the room and I would look over his shoulder and when he got something right, I'd say, exactly right. And then in a classroom conversation, I'd call him out and say, Nick, tell everybody what you think. And slowly, he got a sense of himself as a learner. I don't tell this story to say what a wonderful success I have been as a classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. I tell it because that success was built on failure, actually. Nick's success was actually built on what I learned from Stephen. Classrooms are incredibly complex rhetorical spaces. Um, and I guess what I want to say is that my success in classrooms, such as it is, is only because I have submitted to the relationship in the classroom, to the rhetorical nature of it. My subject matter, my students, which shift every year. And so I would actually say that I do write out my classroom, my, my, I do create 
different lessons for each group who come through, um, who teach, te I, I teach T.S. Eliot every year, I've taught it for five years, this is something exciting. Um, the last two schools I've taught it at, my previous one, the Scots College and now PLC Sydney, have come up with entirely different interpretations of that magnificent poet. I have had to write different lessons for that group because each group took that information and did something different with it. Classrooms are rhetorical spaces. They are exciting places. Students are magnificent. I do believe in giving them the kind of learning that I have learnt. Some of my teachers are here today. I do believe that, taking into the classroom what I have given them, but I don't believe that it will stay the same once I put that in front of the students. The centrality of our faith in evidence-based practice makes me think of Charles Dickens' hard times, if you know it. Um, facts, facts. Facts, facts, exactly. <laughs> it's satirical, and I feel like sometimes we've missed the point. Grad grind. Grad grind. The teacher was called grad grind. I don't want to be grad grind. I want to recognise that the things we're studying can't be broken up into tiny parts, although I do think my children should learn their times tables. <laughs> um, what kind of a thing is teaching? How shall we judge the student and how shall we judge the teacher? Of, of course the judgments need to be made. If anyone were to judge Stephen or me as his teacher in that year I taught Year 9, then I should properly come up wanting. Evidence-based practice and data are critical instruments, instruments to train a teacher's eye to see what she might not have seen before or missed in the hubbub of a classroom, for sure. But it behoves us to remember that a classroom is still not a set of facts. A classroom is not a laboratory, it is a set of relationships. Um, it is a phenomenon. It is a maze of human apprehensions exploding simultaneously. And to do that well, I now come to see a teacher needs to be quiet enough, still enough, to be aware of what she sees, of what she apprehends, and so determine how to act. May we preserve that quiet, still work of human apprehending. And I promised Will Christie, who's sitting here, that I would finish with Coleridge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read two lines from Frost at Midnight, which I think capture what it is that is going on in a classroom. Beneath the crags of ancient mountain and beneath the clouds, which image in their bulk both lakes and shores. As the mountain mirrors the lake, they speak to one another, infinitely, reciprocally. He shall mould thy spirit, and by giving, make it ask. So when I give in the classroom, it asks back. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Sarah, this is marvellous. I, I feel that I'm representing data that's at this okay. point because okay. I have to keep an eye on this. Sorry. Um, um, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's fine. And me? maybe we can. The panel can come back. Well, Ooh. perhaps very quickly. Uh, yeah, then, just, yeah, just, just, just to um, ask if are we uh, conflating evidence-based practice, mm -hmm. which is understanding the science of human cognition, and then doing our teaching cognizant of that and data collection. So in the evidence-based practice that my colleagues and I promote, the most important data is the child, is the mini whiteboard. So being able to see that the child has, has not, uh, knows what you've just taught them. So in, in this, that form of teaching, in evidence-based teaching, mm -hmm. you know, as it's being practised in New South Wales at Marsden mm -hmm. Street and, and, and other examples here and very much in Western Australia, the, um, and in Catholic Education Canberra Goulburn, we say the most important data is the uh, what's on the mini whiteboard. So if and we only teach the next thing if 80% of the kids uh, get it right. So what I was going to take away mm -hmm. from your talk is perhaps the evidence-based teaching movement have started where you got to with Nick, that your job as a teacher is to not create ritualised humiliation. It's to create success. So the way we teach in evidence-based teaching is that you don't teach them, you teach first, then you ask the question, and then the kids tell you the answer. So they're constantly having the experience of success. That is the mode of teaching. So it's joyous because they're constantly winning. 
and that, but they're learning because you're taking responsibility for the repetition and the retrieval that encodes their memories. And there's lots of chanting and singing and, and learning by heart. So you're creating those conditions that you beautifully and deliberately created for Nick. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic, so. fantastic. Mm. Well, Elizabeth, would you like to... Um, um, sure. To um, well, they said seven minutes, pick a topic, and I thought, gosh, I could rant about a whole lot of things for seven <laughs> yeah. minutes. Which, which one am I going to choose? Um, uh, uh, Pache, your beautiful lyrical description of, of what that, you know, just this <laughs> exceptional uplifting classrooms. Mm. I know exactly what you're talking about. That's why we, we keep really. coming back year after year, right? Yeah. Um, uh, that said, as you rightly emphasised, um, Sarah, data does tell us a few things. Um, and everyone is rightly concerned if you look at uh, PISA, TIMS, you know, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear over, what, 20, 30, 40 years that um, we're all concerned that the standard of, um, the, of Australian students in those kinds of testing just appears to have had a steady trajectory downwards. Um, and I don't think you have to even rely on the data. Talk to you know, university lecturers, they'll tell you I've got first year undergraduates. I can't set readings that are of the length and density that I used to be able to set. Um, they just cannot cope with the same kinds of materials that they could 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're all pretty much on the same page when we say there's something going on and it's mm -hmm. not great in terms mm -hmm. of the uh, nationwide, in terms of quality. Um, and I think that if we're to tackle this, and people really want to tackle this, we've never spent more on education. You know, there's a, there's a huge commitment and understanding, rightly so. But if we're going to tackle this, I think we need to start asking a question which actually, to my knowledge, I don't think recall ever being asked in any part of educational debate, and that is what actually belongs in schools and what doesn't. Mm. Uh, because it seems to me that the sole criterion for something being taught in schools now is that we say it's a good thing to know. It's a good thing for kids to know. It's a good thing to add for adults to know. And so we, you know, let's just put the, the academic curriculum to one side and we say, okay, well, you know, we've got, I don't know, a six-year-old. Should they be taught about stranger danger? Yes, they should. I want six-year-olds everywhere to know about stranger danger and bodily autonomy. We should do that. Um, and then we, we say, well, what about, um, I don't know, nutrition? That's really important. We, we don't want a population that, that can't make good choices. Yes, nutrition is good. Sleep as well. Yes, we should definitely do that. Uh, how about exercise? Yes, sleep, nutrition, exercise, uh, yeah, dental health. That's also important. Um, and then as they get older, there are more and more things. So we need to uh, teach them social and emotional skills. That's a very important part of, of, of what we talk about in education. We teach them friendship skills. Then there's anti-bullying, and we have to have specific programs for that because that's really important. Uh, and then all sorts of well-being th things come in. We talk. Um, we've never talked more about mental health, and we've never been less successful uh, at um, bringing our young people into a state of mental health. Um, so we've got well-being, mental health, obviously that has to be ongoing. Um, then we start getting into the high school years and you add, I mean, pick your thing, right? You know, there's going to be, um, or we need to do drugs and alcohol and then maybe it's not just illicit drugs, maybe we need to start talking about legal, uh, abuse of legal substances. And then um, how about some safe partying and some safe driving, financial literacy, who wants their young person to go out there and they can't, this is a disgrace. Uh, citizenship of all kinds, they need to have all of these things. And then we take something really simple like sexual consent. You know, let's, let's, let's say we really find that important. What are schools doing about it? Um, and if you just pause for a minute, the structure of the school year has not changed in 40 or 50 years. We've got the same number of teaching days that we've always had. The structure of the school day hasn't changed. We've still got, what, six hours a day if you're lucky if they all come and they're fed and they're ready to go, which half mm -hmm. the time they're not. Every minute that you take to do these super important topics, no one's disputing that they're important, every minute that you spend on that is something that we're not send spending on the academic core curriculum. Um, and don't forget too, we're not just talking about classroom time and where students are directing their attention, we're also talking about where teachers are directing their attention. Because every one of those programs somebody has to create a curriculum for it. Mm. And some teachers like that. 
Yeah, they might do it from scratch in completely different contexts and they have to create resources for it. Then they have to do PD. I have never done as much PD in my life as in my teaching career. And we do two hours, two full days of youth mental health first aid courses just to get our staff up to speed. And then we do annual uh, first aid courses and we do EpiPen training and fire extinguisher training and then we've all got to be trained in how to deliver the sexual consent stuff but actually we've got to devise that because there's actually no program out there that's actually proven to work. We create an enormous workload and the opportunity cost on our children's learning is not once considered. I mean, literally three weeks ago there was a op-ed in the paper from a university researcher and she said, I've surveyed parents, they want more sex education in schools. Well, of course they do. Who wants to do sex education with their own kids, right? That's <laughs> definitely a topic that schools should do. Um, but no one stops and says, you know what? Let's halve the time they spend on T.S. Eliot to create the space for sexual consent. Nobody ever says that. No one ever faces up to the reality. And then that all fits in just one bucket, which is the non-academic stuff. When we look at what's happened in the academic sphere, it's actually been the same phenomenon and probably had greater effect. So I could give you examples in maths, in English, uh, history, science, geography. Uh, let me just pick English. <clears throat> right. So let's say 40 years ago, the teaching of English was primarily about the written word. We wanted them to read well, we wanted them to write well. And in fact, we felt quite comfortable with saying we will primarily do that through classic literature. And that really meant the, the canon of English literature. So was it narrow? Yes, it was. But and it was- Russian. And a oh, Russian. Right, okay, fair enough. Um, in the last two years, maybe not for the six-year-olds, but, um, um, Okay, so then someone rightly pointed out, well, hang on, we're in Australia. You know, what, where's, where's Australian literature in this? We should do Australian. Yes, we should. And then they said, well, why all of the classic literature? Let's do contemporary literature. Contemporary Australian literature would also be good. And now we need some Indigenous voices. I'm 100% in favour of that. We definitely need representations from the stories of First Nations people because of the storytelling that you've both mm -hmm. talked about. Um, Asian. And then, Asian. Okay, right. And so then we have cross-curricular priorities which say, well, we need Asian perspectives. Um, and then, you know, well, if you're going to understand world history, you probably need something from the US. And if you're going to do North America, you probably should do South America. And then everything, right? And we don't have a minute more of teaching time mm. than we used to. Mm. That's not the worst of it. <laughs> because... <laughs> Somewhere in the last 20 years, we suddenly realise that actually we're living in a very image-based society and that a whole lot of communication happens through both still and moving images. Well, we need to teach kids about that, right? Um, so now images and how you use images is now in the English curriculum. And the study, film studies, that is in many places on a par with the, the, the textual studies that they do. And they have to do persuasive texts and they have to do short form and they have to do long form. They study advertising, they study websites, they study social media, they create podcasts, we do the spoken word and that's all just in the English curriculum. Mm. So we are teaching our children a mile wide and an inch deep. And the recipe for that is a lack of rigour and a lack of uh, actual knowledge about the world. You know, it is they're having these images, these, it's like a sort of strobe light, here's something, here's something, here's mm. something. And it's not connected in that tradition of storytelling. You don't have the time, if you're teaching T.S. Eliot, to think about, you know, what was the world history behind that and the six different genres that he's drawing on and the biblical allusions and so on. I try. You try. Yeah, well, well done you. <laughs> I'm sure you're doing a fantastic job. Um, is it any wonder? Why would we blame children? And certainly, why would we blame teachers? Mm. And notice, too, that the teachers again, are having to, so some of them would actually probably welcome, I suspect, a really good detailed curriculum with prepared resources, and others might say, no, I want to start with a blank piece of paper. Well, at the moment, the way that the curriculum works, they, in most schools, they, they start with a blank piece of paper, right? And, and so you're inventing all of this. Well, what's the likelihood that a single each English department is going to have the expertise to do all this well? Yeah. So what I would like to see is a recognition that curriculum is a zero-sum game. Mm. 
And every time we say this is X, we should teach X because it's good, the second half of the sentence should be at the expense of Y, which although worthy, is less necessary than X. And that, that is a conversation we have never had. I've never heard any of the proponents for all of these very valuable things offer up, this is what we need to compromise on, this is what we need to take out, this is what we need to do less of. All we do is more, and in the end, that means we do less. We're obsessed with the problems of misinformation and how, you know, critical thinking. You cannot think critically if you don't know anything. You don't even know that you should be looking it up. That's why the Google thing doesn't work. And the best protection against misinformation and all of that stuff that we're trying to protect them on from online is actually knowing something about the subject matter. Mm. And they don't. Right. Here ended the lecture. Wow. <laughs> well done. <laughs> These were three such wonderful and very different presentations. I've got this whole page of questions. But there, I think there are times when a mediator just has to get out of the way. Um, and this is one of those times. So I'm sure everybody in the audience has questions that they want to ask Eleanor, Sarah, and Elizabeth. So I'm just going to hand, hand the opportunity straight to all of you to ask any of them questions, or indeed for you to ask each other questions. So anybody. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think that one of the things I take away very quickly is, is the complexity of all of this mm -hmm. uh, and that classroom teaching is. Um, but I really appreciate the, the eminent reasonableness of this conversation. And I'm wondering why the reasonable conversations happen in small rooms mm -hmm. uh, and they are so drowned out mm -hmm. by the um, unreasonableness that is plaguing us in our schools and the um, pressure on schools to behave in ways which I think most teachers by far do not want to behave. Mm. Um, mm. What, what is causing this, which is so great, to be so totally drowned out? Whichever order. I, I was at a, um, a conference earlier in the year where what was under discussion was one of the spicier at least in the Australian media at the moment, there's spicier um, topics being discussed in the pay for teachers. And there was a representative of the Catholic schools, a representative um, from the independent schools, and a representative from the government schools. And the question was thrown to the panel, um, what, what should we do about the pay for teachers? And the microphone was thrown to the, uh, the head of the independent the representative of independent schools, and she leaned forward and said, I think we should pay all teachers more. <laughs> and nobody knew what to do because she had made the case for the person sitting to her right and the person sitting to her left. So I think there is more agreement in teachers. I actually do think that there's a real collegiality among teachers because, because this is a vocation. Yeah. I act, we're trying to serve students. That's what we're trying to do. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I quite understood the, the reference that you were making. I mean, if you look at Edu Twitter, um, mm. where decency goes to die, right? Like, it, you're not going to get, um, uh, you know, huge quality debate there. Um, but you do get some really interesting references. Like, I, I use it quite a lot to mm. hear what's going on in the world. Um, look, I, I think... Um, you know, teachers, we're all human beings. And um, I would say that, that as part of my uh, teacher training, my university education for teaching, um, I really wasn't exposed to the sorts of basic knowledge that Eleanor was outlining. That, that was something I had to discover for myself long after I qualified. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. when you don't... So uh, part of this comes back to constructivism, right, and relativistic thinking, mm -hmm. um, which is, so if, if we sort of said, look, there, there is an objective truth out there and we're all on a search to find it and we've all got to have some epistemic humility because who am I to say that my view is necessarily correct and yours, um, but at least we could agree that we're all trying to search for some truth that lies outside us. If you go into relativistic thinking 
And, and we are kind of saturated in that kind of thinking in our society, where all judgments are, all value judgments are equal, and who, you know, what right have you to tell me what I should be doing or preferring? Then, um, you know, a la Nietzsche and so on, or everything just becomes an exercise of power. And so if you are a teacher who doesn't understand that there's been really good quality research which just shows how the human brain works, which is not to say we know everything, right? Like mm. no one can tell me why year nine, last period, Wednesday afternoon when it's windy <laughs> is impossible. I don't know why that, there's no MRI scan that's <laughs> going to tell me that. But there are things that we do know. You know, we, we know that some things will work better than others. But if you haven't been trained in that, and you are instinctively attracted to the Rousseauian kind of, look, all children just get out of the way of the learning and look a six-year-old and ask them what they can do with a paper clip and they've got 500 things and you ask a grown-up and they only have 23 and we just happily overlook the fact that the six-year-old is going, I can use it as an antenna for aliens. Um, <laughs> That's not useful, right? Like, but if, if, if that is instinctively attractive to you, that we just kind of get out of the way of kids and let them sort of soak it all up and have these brilliant conversations and then we'll all be talking about Aristotle. And become, um, become themselves. And become themselves, right. Um, then if I come into you and go, actually, you know, that may not work, it just sounds like an exercise of power. It's like, well, you like teaching that way and I like teaching this way and who are you to tell me? I do think there is a missing underlying um, disciplinary knowledge yes. um, that, that is really hindering the debate. Because if you don't understand that, um, and, and it, it, at the beginning of my teaching career, I knew instinctively how I liked to teach. Uh, and I learned afterwards that some of it was in line with actually how kids learn and some of it wasn't. And I had to sort of have some humility and change the things that needed to change. But it helped that I understood that it was coming from a research base. Um, and that still doesn't tell me what to do with Year 9 last period on a Wednesday afternoon. All of the relational stuff that Sarah was talking about comes into play. But until we get that knowledge in the profession, it is largely missing in my view, then it just comes down to um, a, a, a sort of a, a power exercise about I like my, my method better than yours. And I don't know if that's helpful. I, thank you, it was. I, I just wanted to add to that that so we really do have what Thomas Kuhn called in the structure of scientific revolution two paradigms. So we have a constructivist um, paradigm, mm. Um, mm. the aforementioned Rousseau, and that the job of education is to allow the natural child to emerge, and then we have um, the what you might call the evidence-based paradigm or the knowledge, the knowledge-based oh. paradigm, and that is very little at the moment. So there would be there's 9,500 schools in Australia, and there might be a hundred who are who are focused on the knowledge-rich, um, more evidence-based approach. So I think the unreasonableness comes from that when you've got two rival paradigms, they actually can't speak to each other. They speak over each other. And so we're in, we're in that, um, that situation. Could I add one further point, which is that a lot of the time we talk at cross purposes because we're trying, and this maybe, is, maybe this resonates with you, Sarah, we're trying to apply, um, or we assume that when someone makes a statement, it has universal application. Mm -hmm. So you talked about biologically primary and biologically secondary. Another way I might explain it to people is just beginners and advanced, right? A beginner learner. So let me take a tennis analogy. You want your kid to be the next um, uh, um, Ash Bartley, um, and you, you say, I want my, my child to win Wimbledon. What you don't do is just say, here's a tennis court and a racket, knock yourself out. Right? Like you don't do that. You go, okay, we're going to run you through a whole lot of basic strokes. You're going to do 10,000 back, you know, back uh, hands and forehands, and then you're going to look, you know, mm. and you piece it together. And then at a certain point, you start saying, okay, well, now you've got the tools to be creative, and now I'm going to put you up against different styles of player, and you're going to have that interaction, and we'll see what comes of it. Um, you know, w when you were talking, Sarah, about, you know, we, we have to you know, respond to who's in front of us, I might do, do, deliver completely different lessons. You're operating a high level because you're That's talking correct. about... I'm stay, a high school teacher. Right, you're a high school teacher and you're mm -hmm. talking probably year 10, 11, 12 maybe. Sometimes um, not. And, and probably pretty literate kids and all of that. 
Um, it's no surprise that Eleanor, when she was using examples, might have picked on times tables, which eight, mm -hmm. you know, seven and eight-year-olds do, right? And so kids move through a progression, and I think there is a false dichotomy yes. because yes. people say, um, oh, well, if you are all about um, developing knowledge and, you know, you should memorise and stuff, they, they think that you're saying that at all ages and stages, which is not true. Um, and or people say, well, it's all about the interplay and relationships and, and connecting it with their own lives and the incredible conversations and who they are as human beings and the, the spiritual act of engaging in these things together. Um, that's great, but it's probably not going to teach a seven-year-old when they use a capital letter, right? So I think a lot of the time the heat comes out of that too because we're not precise enough about the classroom things that we're describing. Very helpful, Elizabeth. Thank you. And I, I think that, that the other thing I would like to say is that, um, and I don't know that it necessarily is teachers themselves who use um, an either or way of thinking, but, but if, if education is phrenesis, if that is the best way to think, then actually the words we use need to use are if, then, or I wonder, or um, and, or... Th those sorts of, th I think, I actually think that we will get the best case scenario in Australia when we can learn to have a conversation about it. I would have thought education has to be episteme, techne, and phrenesis. At moments, yeah. Yeah, that the classroom is an environment where it's, a, it's all three. I would say, I suppose, as, as someone who's in a classroom all of the time, that the way I think about the classroom is phrenesis. Do I reach for the other two? as tools, absolutely. But the wisdom to know what to grab when comes from the phrenesis. Yeah. Yeah. You, do, you don't think that the history of um, education and education theory since medieval times has been one of phrenesis getting slowly, slowly squeezed to I death absolutely think by that. the other two? I absolutely and think that. And we've kind of got to the end point. I should have got you to speak, Simon. But, that was exactly what I was trying but to say. <laughs> episteme, but episteme is not uh, data. So episteme no, no. is not the scientific no, it's method. Pure, it's pure episteme it's is truth. theory. So mm. actually, I would have thought, and you know, the Catholic intellectual tradition would be that um, that in the Catholic intellectual tradition we have ratio and intellectus. So the most important. So ratio is reasoning, and intellectus is the contemplation that can only come when you're apprehending and that you're able to encounter the truth. So it, it, it's different to reasoning. Uh, Joseph Piper describes this beautifully. And that in the medieval tradition, that was what we had as education, mm -hmm. that one had to cultivate young people who were able to do both uh, mm -hmm. ras ratio, rationality, uh, a piss, a um, empirical and uh, reasoning, mm -hmm. but also intellectus. And I would have thought that what's happened in our modern education and also. system, <laughs> and also, and also, yeah, yeah, and what's yeah. happened is that we no longer have any place for intellectus for that um, in that more intuitive. I mean, poetry is intellectus. And, and Eleanor, you don't think that the the, the um the, the two paradigms that you mentioned a minute ago, yeah. there's actually just one and then a group of a small group of dissenters. No, I, I think uh, it's a question. Yeah, I think in other words, the constructivism. Rich, so within the yeah. knowledge rich family, can I just say in the UK right now the debate has shifted and talked about the science of learning people that we're into process too. So the constructivist people are into process and it's all about the social construction of knowledge. Mm -hmm and that they're accusing us, and I think it's fair, that's why I'm getting into this intellectus um, mm. piece and episteme, that you have the deep knowledge, um, because otherwise we're just about process too. Science mm. of learning is just about how the human learns. It's nothing about what we Thank should you. learn. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question at the front. Thank you. Um, Paul Burgess, I'm actually from PLC Sydney as well, so. Thank um, Sarah and all of you for the work that you've done. All of you are referring to intermittently to philosophy and theology. Mm -hmm. um, at our school, we have a philosophy and theology course in years nine and ten. There's a the IB has a theory of knowledge course. Oh, awesome! Is there a place in schools for a higher level thinking course for students? Yes. 
that help to help them to um, take the types of positions that all of you have taken tonight. Well, Mike, finish the sentence, Paul. What do we take out? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's, yes, but in a sense, some of the, actually, I think it fits Elizabeth actually with the core of what you are saying, that the curriculum should be king, and therefore we, this is the baseline for helping students to think and know, rather than um, allowing them to just have islands of knowledge. I'd like to add to that and to respond to Elizabeth's what do we take out by saying that if we had the right curriculum resources for our teachers and if we went back to a more explicit style of teaching, we can get through a hell of a lot more knowledge and curriculum in primary school mm. so that when uh, children, uh, young people arrive at year seven, they are ready to, to go for it. And what you're dealing with is exactly what the universities now tell us they're dealing with, which is people who come and they have to teach them all of year 11 and 12 maths mm -hmm. to do economics or engineering. And, and the and latest iterations of the Australian curriculum are pushing into higher years things that our exactly. Australian kids used to be, used to be to do doing younger. at 11 and 12. So yeah. I would say that yeah. that's how to create more space mm -hmm. for this sort of stuff at the end, because to your rich... I'd love to be in your T.S. Eliot classrooms, but that is what we used to achieve in the 80s. We used to get kids to the point in year 11 and 12 where they were writing their own plays at, that were rich and brilliant and discussing great literature. They had built enough from the nursery rhyme stage all the way through and, and that, that they could go there in year 11 and 12. Well, outside of the private schools, that you're not get, you used to get that and you're not getting that now at the population level, and our kids deserve it. Uh, mm. there was a, there's a question in the middle here, yes. Thank you. Uh, speaking as a parent of uh, three teenage kids, I was struck by my journey up Hunter Street to this event this evening. I was called in to referee a debate between my 14-year-old son and his mother about whether he could go to football to training tonight because he had too much work to do. Last week, his 12-year-old sister in Year 8 was up beyond midnight, four nights on the trot, because she had so much schoolwork to do. Once till 2 a.m., once till 4 a.m. <gasps> we push back and we discuss this with the school, and they're saying, I think to Elizabeth's point here, there is so much they're being asked to yeah. do. Mm. They don't have the time, they don't have the bandwidth to be efficient, so they just push so much stuff out of the classroom onto the children, mm. and, and I'm angry because this is their childhood that's been taken away from them. Agreed. Um, this enough. is putting untold pressure on them, yeah. and the resource isn't there. I guess my question mm. flowing from that uh, is, are actually parents uh, being tapped as a resource in the way they could be and potentially should be to, to share some of that burden? So many of the things you talked about, the examples you gave about consent and sexual education, all of these things, online safety, is there, is there a way that we can just take some of that away from the schools and equip parents and go round the side? And, and if so, who does that? Who takes responsibility? Who resources? Who helps the parents do that? Well, I, I think it's the law of unintended consequences, right? Because um, any commitment to, you know, equity between students of different parental backgrounds says some of them will have access to parents who can deliver this and can't, mm -hmm. some won't. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm all for equipping parents. We try on various things to do that, but I think you are fighting against a couple of things. Um, one is that um, the kids with most need probably won't have the, the parents who will turn mm -hmm. up and do that really well. Um, so I understand why that's gone there. Also, I don't actually think schools are particularly good at it, right? Like, it's not, it's not our skill set, it's not what we're trained to do, and we sort of take it on because we see a need. Um, so I don't have the answer for you necessarily on that, but I do think there's another broader social trend, um, which is, again, we just used to be more confident, and, I, I, you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder, is this also the slow creep of relativism in, in, in life? Because, you know, we've got to value our children, and they're young people, and, and they've got great opinions, and, you know, parents used to go, oh, shut up, you don't know anything, right? And, and it was over. Uh, and now it's a knockdown fight, and we've got to justify it and persuade them, and... 
it actually really, parents <laughs> lack an enormous amount of confidence. Um, I, I, um, an anecdote, when I first became a head of a school, I avoided telling parents what to do because I thought, oh gosh, you know, I haven't been trained, like, what, who am I to say? Anyway, in my sort of weekly newsletter home to parents, I soon discovered that the most popular ones was where I basically scolded them into parenting uh, <laughs> and said, just say no, and this is normal to insist on a bedtime, and they're all going to say that their, you know, 10-year-old friends have smartphones, and it's not true, and you don't have to fall. <laughs> and they would contact me, go, oh, what a relief. <laughs> And then they'd contact me and say, could you make it a school rule that they're not allowed to have smartwatches? Because I just bought her one for Christmas, but I don't want her to wear it. I, that's a real example, right? Um, and so parents used to feel so much more confident about saying, I am the wisest person in this relationship. I may not be perfect, but I've probably got more to offer on this issue than you do, seven-year-old. Um, and we really have societally undermined that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have a great answer to that, um, but I, do, I will throw in one thing, which is I think the pernicious effects of technology. Um, there is no data anywhere which convincingly shows that the high use of technology in schools leads to improved learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a good, good chunk of data which says it actually decreases learning, and yeah. there are little pockets maybe where it helps. But for the most part, now when you think how we've invested it, how that is the norm. And I was in a school once where we said that the um, students could have access to all the technology they wanted during the day, and the classroom teacher could control it, but the homework now had to be set without using technology. It had to be pen and paper. Mm -hmm. Well, this transformed things, yeah. and I was in a very good school with great colleagues, but I can tell you if I'm feeling really under pressure and I've got to set homework and I'm like, you know, I haven't got time to do it properly, setting them something like write 200 words on parasites is a really quick and easy task, and they can just go home and Google, right? But the kids don't know what they're doing, so they end up with something that's suitable for third-year biology students, and then they try, you know. And often that's how they end up at 4 a.m. in the morning still working on it. Mm -hmm. And when we changed it, the teachers then had to go, right, I actually have to make sure I have curated resources which are age appropriate mm -hmm. and that they have access to them. And then they would go home and they completed on time. And we started getting radically different feedback from what was going on at home. Interesting. And if you don't, that is a very hard thing to control. Uh, and really, I think very few schools really regulate and monitor that as closely as I think is probably warranted. Yeah. Thank you. No, no comment. Can I, Please. Can I also no. say, too, that I, I have noticed over the time that I've been teaching, and possibly since I graduated, that slowly over time, I think the myth of scarcity has colonised the way students think about education. They think of it as, as of excellence and of knowledge and of doing well as scarce. And it takes a lot of convincing to make, it, to invite even, even the strong girls at my school to encourage them to participate in this wealth of knowledge that Eleanor is talking about, that it is available for all of them. We, we talk about education, and I do think it is driven by um, perhaps the ways that we report back to the students about what their success is. Mm. Um, I think over the time that I have taught, um, for better or for worse, students are more interested in the rank than they are in the mark that produces the rank. Um, and so that produces this idea that education and excellence and knowledge and joy in, in classrooms is scarce. And I like to believe that it isn't, that this tradition in which we're working is a giving and a fruitful and an abundant one. So I they just, can go I, to bed at I, nine. I, I just hate having to be the person who says <laughs> this, but we're coming to, towards the end of our time. So when, maybe we can have just one more question from the gentleman just, just here. <laughs> um, so, uh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much, um, all of you. I really loved all, all of what you said, the conditionality of um, uh, evidence-based um, practice in that way, and then also um, I really resonated with what you said 
Um, I can talk all about Vygotsky's social constructivism, but I was never taught cognitive load theory in my master's exactly. teaching, which is exactly. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm. My question is more about in the classroom. Um, I'm all about creating rigor for my mm. students, and I also, also find that students actually aspire for that rigor if you present mm -hmm. it to them. They rise mm -hmm. to the occasion, which mm. I love. Um, my question was particularly on your point about how the New South Wales syllabus or in, in Australia more generally is very broad. Could that be an unintended strength in the sense that we could bring this rigor to them in the classroom setting? Um, and if so, is that the only way we can uh, assist with this problem in, in, in within a classroom or is there a school-wide approach we could um, assist with this? That was my question. Well, look, um, yes and no. There are leeways of choice um, within the curriculum and so a highly expert teacher who has really rigorous discipline knowledge may well be in that position. Um, but actually, I think, first of all, you have to have years and years and years of teaching experience to really devise a beautiful curriculum. And even then, it's a minority, like not everybody is interested in it or good at it. So it's, it's possible, <clears throat> but super hit and miss. Um, and then, um, to give you an example that, that one of my uh, English teaching colleagues at my school pointed out, she said, you know, um, there are requirements, for instance, in the New South Wales English curriculum where you have to do, you know, a, no um, a novel which, you know, meets the sort of the Asian um, perspectives thing, and then you have to do one that deal deals with environmental sustainability, sustainability, and then you have to do First one Nations. that, I can't remember, something else. First Nations. And, yeah. and so she was giving, um, yeah, that's the third priority, but the, the, the novel she had in mind, um, uh, many, many schools do it, I won't name it because I don't want to shame anyone who's chosen it, but her view is that it was a um, text that was largely chosen for year seven or eight because it was a three for one. It ticked three particular boxes. It wasn't actually a very good book, right? But if you are having to... You know the one, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I do. It's um, and um, and it, it teaches everywhere. It's a Tetris puzzle, right? Because mm. they put these requirements in um, and it's quite hard to, to tick all of the boxes. Um, that's what determines whether or not you are fit to operate as a school when they come in, is show me your programs and have you ticked all of those boxes. Yeah. So, um, you know, and also, we've also got a generation of, of younger teachers coming in who themselves haven't necessarily had that quality of curriculum. They don't know what they're missing out on either. So, um, yeah, theoretically possible, but I think it would be far too rare if we, we just assume that that's possible. And I would say have a look at two uh, examples overseas. So one is go to the Core Knowledge Foundation and just look at the, whatever your subject matter, whether it's um, um, <coughs> language arts or, or history, just see what are the knowledge-rich curriculum that spirals around from kindy to 12 where it gets to. And another one I found recently that's fascinating, I don't know if people know that there's now a thousand schools in the United States who've abandoned the social studies type curriculum or the abandoned the fragmented curriculum and are going with the um, liberal arts curriculum. And so one of these schools, St. Jerome's Academy in um, St. Jerome's Academy have an educational plan on the website, their website, 120 pages, and it shows what they teach from kindy through to year 12. And that's being adopted a, um, a lot of places around the world because, you know, this is similar curriculum to what you would have had, um, except it's got Tolkien and stuff in it, but it's similar curriculum that, to what you would have had 100 years ago. Mm. And then you have, yeah, so there's different inspiring things happening around the world. And the British, the English curriculum is also excellent. I think a really good head of faculty or head of department, scope and sequencing is one of the funnest things to do, <laughs> um, which is to map from the beginning the time the student enters to the time the student leaves. Yeah. How are we going to map so it is true that, that to do what I do in year 12, we need to have done some things in year seven. That's true. And to map the whole thing through. So I, I am blessed because I have a brilliant head of faculty who knows how to build the capacity for my students to be able to. And, and it's also true, just to, I guess, bring this together, that I tell them things too. I do tell them about biblical illusions because they don't know that. They actually don't know them. It's astonishing. 
the, the lack of, they didn't know David and Goliath, I it's shocking. One, I had one looking at a, a picture of the Virgin Mary, she said, but Who's it does, she said, does it look like Madonna? I, I, had, I had first year university students who were telling the class, no, 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 Jesus, it's like Father Claus, he didn't, it's not, yeah, it's Father, yeah. Yeah, Santa Claus. I guess, I guess if you, if you scope and sequence well, and then you give the students what you know that they will need, um, to be able to enter the space that you want to enter. I sometimes say to my students um, when, when they come into my classroom at the very beginning of a course, there will be a point in this class, and it won't be until the end, where I will sit down. And when I sit down, that is a sign I'm asking you to start playing. Mm. I think you are at the place now to speak with me. And I guess it's it, that to me, good scope and sequencing enables me to do that. And yet the latest um, uh, draft of the English, New South Wales English, mm -hmm. English curriculum, after all of the consultation has finished, mm -hmm. came out with an extra bullet point, mm -hmm. which is that to add to everything else they've done, you should be adding student chosen texts. Um, on, they, on, they put that in after, after they asked after, the teachers. After, yeah. and, and everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, what, what a good point to stop. Um, mm. Elizabeth said earlier uh, that there's only so many hours in a day, mm. but this has been an amazing illustration of just how much you can get into one hour. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's been just a privilege listening to the three of you, Eleanor, Sarah and Elizabeth, Three presentations all, all merged into one. We could, we could, go, we, we could go all night and, and come back and do it again next week. But thank you all so much. It's been fantastic. <laughs>